Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's Archives.com live stream. I'm Amy Johnson Crow, and this week we are going to tackle the topic of forget sibling rivalry, get answers from your ancestors' siblings. Now, when we're working on our genealogy, we have a tendency to focus on that direct line. You know, you think about an ancestor chart and how it's laid out, and it shows that direct line. It shows exactly who the parents are and how you come down through this family tree. And so it makes it very easy to think about those specific people. And that's great for an organizational standpoint because, you know, it, it does help us visualize this family tree better. But the bad thing is that we can get so focused on that direct line that we lose a sense of the other people in the family. And there are a lot more people in this family. This is just a portion of the same tree that we had here. But instead of showing just the direct line, this view is showing me all of the siblings. And when we think about this, we think about all of those other people that are in that family tree. Consider that any of them could have an answer that you are seeking. So instead of being focused solely on that direct line, just those direct ancestors, let's broaden our search, let's broaden who we're looking at, and also consider those siblings, because they could have that information that we're looking for. So a very good thing to think about, and this is a relatively easy record set to get into, relatively easy record set to use. So let's think about the census. Have you found all of the siblings in all of the censuses that they should appear in? This is an example from the 1880 census. And what I want to point out here is that here in the household of Jonas Burgett, now he's the head of household, he's the one that's, that's shown up here, we have Jonas Burgett, head of household. Also living in this household are two very important people. John C. Archer, who is listed as his grandfather, and Elizabeth Archer, who is listed as his grandmother. Now remember, beginning in 1880, the censuses will show us relationships of everyone with their relationship to that head of household. So John Archer and Elizabeth Archer are the grandparents of Jonas Burgett. So not only have we added another generation onto this family tree, but indirectly, this is giving us Jonas's mother's maiden name. Because if this had been John and Elizabeth Burgett, well, then that would have been Jonas's father's parents. But since the surname is different, then we can presume that this is his maternal grandfather and his maternal grandmother. And their last name is Archer. So it's giving us a lot of information here in this one census. Well, let's say that you don't descend from Jonas, but you descend from Jonas's brother, John. Well, these grandparents are only going to be living in one household per census. So if we didn't look for Jonas in this 1880 census, we might miss this very important information, the grandparents' names and some indirect evidence about the mother's maiden name being Archer. What about the death records of those siblings? It's important to keep in mind two things when you're thinking about death records. Different information was requested for a death record at different times 
and or different places. And we'll take a look at an example here in just a moment. Something else to keep in mind is that the informant can make a difference. Who is giving that information for that death record can have a huge difference in what you see being recorded. Want to take a look first at records changing over time. And as an example, we'll look in Ohio. Now, Ohio started keeping civil death records in 1867, and they were originally recorded in the county probate courts in large registers. You know, those really big, thick books. You know, they're really huge, really heavy. You know, you didn't know that you were going to have to do weightlifting when you started genealogy. So Ohio is keeping their death records in these large registers from 1867 through December 1908. What's important to note about that is that these early death records in Ohio did not ask for the parents' names unless the person who died was an infant. That's the only time that they were supposed to record the parents' names. Now, that changed in December 1908 when Ohio started keeping what we think of as modern death certificates. Now, these death certificates that we start seeing in December 1908 asked for the parents' names for all deceased, no matter their age. So whether they were an infant or they were 102 years old, there was a place where the parents' names were supposed to be recorded. So that's going to make a difference on what we find as we're going through our family history research. Because in different years, you're going to have different types of records. So here we have a family, actually out of my own research, we have the father, John Starkey, the mother is named Mary, unknown last name for her. We, we don't have a maiden name for Mary. But we do know that John and Mary had at least two sons. They had a son, Peter, who died in 1907 in Ohio, and a son, Noah, who died in 1912 in Ohio. So if we start with Peter, and we look at Peter Starkey's death record, it tells us that he died the 11th of December, 1907, in Thorn Township, Perry County that he was aged 77 years, one month, eight days. His birthplace, yeah, they were supposed to fill that in, but it was blank. And his occupation was listed as laborer. The parents' names were not recorded. And again, it's because at this time period in Ohio, in 1907, that wasn't a question that you had to answer when the person who died was 77 years old. Now, if he had been just eight days old, yes, they should have, they should have filled in the fields for the parents' names, but they didn't do that since he was age 77. So here we have Peter's death record. Could his brother Noah's death record tell us more? Now remember, Noah died in Ohio in 1912. And by 1912, Ohio is keeping modern death certificates with a lot more information. And here we have Noah Starkey's death certificate. And indeed, we find that they have listed the name of the father and the name of the mother with her maiden name, listed as Mary Monroe. Now, I will want to use this as a clue because this information is only as accurate as what this informant knew, but it's a clue that I didn't have before. It wasn't on Peter's death record, but it is on his brother Noah's death certificate. So again, looking at that sibling is giving me a clue for further research. Now, talking about the informant on a death record. Here we have a portion of the death certificates for two of Peter's children. So we're, we're coming forward a generation here. So 
brother and sister, these are, are their death certificates. One informant gave the mother's name as Elizabeth Denon. The other informant gave the mother's maiden name as Wilson. So who's correct? Well, to be honest, I don't know yet. I need to do more research, but both of these death certificates have given me clues for names that I should be on the lookout for, that I need to be looking at Denon families and I need to be looking at Wilson families to see if I can figure out that last name for Elizabeth. Again, because that informant is different for the death certificates of these two siblings. Now, the same strategy applies to other types of records. Think about marriage records. In many states, early marriage records don't list the names of the parents, but more recent ones do. So do you have a time span where these different siblings are being married? Are some of the younger siblings getting married in a time where marriage records are listing the parents' names? And also, think about birth records. You know, you might have found the birth record for your ancestor and darn, it didn't list the mother's maiden name like it was supposed to. Look for the birth records for those brothers and sisters. It might be listed on theirs. So again, thinking about what type of information changes on that record over the years and also, you know, what might be missing on yours might have been filled in on somebody else's. So not only, again, this works not only for death records, but is also applicable for marriage and birth records. I can't stress enough how important it is to find the obituaries of all of the siblings because the information in an obituary can vary widely from person to person. And don't overlook the siblings who died young or who died single. Now, sometimes it, it's tempting to just, you know, skip over them because, oh, you know, how detailed is their obituary going to be? You might be surprised. So look for all of the siblings, with, you know, including the ones who died young and the ones who died single, you know, unmarried, no children, look for their obituaries as well. Here's an example from a newspaper, the Jasper, Indiana Courier from the 9th of June, 1876. And the headline, Joseph Sermersheim's Sudden Death. Now, it's, as you can see, it's a pretty long obituary. So I've pulled out some of the key facts in it. We have the name of the deceased, Joseph Sermersheim, died the 1st of June, 1876. His obituary tells us he was born in January, 1819, that he was married in Germany, and that he immigrated to the United States in 1840. So a lot of really good biographical information in Joseph Sermersheim's obituary. And note that it says married in Germany. That's as specific as the obituary gets. It doesn't give us a town. It doesn't give us a region. It just says married in Germany. Compare this to the obituary for his brother, John. And this is in that same newspaper, the Jasper, Indiana Courier. Now, brother John died the 22nd of May, 1902. And it says that he died at the residence of his nephew, John, in Jasper. So again, we've got good biographical information here on John. But as we go through the obituary and pick out more details, it notes that he is a native of Baden, Germany. So we still don't have a specific town, but at least now we have a region. He was born the 30th of March, 1822, immigrated to the U.S. in 1847, settling in Dubois County, 
and that he lived with his brother Joseph. So we have a statement of relationship. So we know that this John is the brother of that Joseph that we had looked at earlier. So if John was a native of Baden, might Joseph also have been a native of Baden, Germany? Again, looking at this obituary for the sibling, and John never married, never had children, lived with his brother Joseph, and then when Joseph died, John moved in with his nephew John. So again, you know, this John never married, but he has a wonderful, wonderful obituary that is going to give us a clue to further our research for the rest of the family. So when you are stuck on an ancestor, you can't find any more clues, you can't identify the parents, you can't find a mother's maiden name, stop for a moment and think about what you have looked at for the siblings. Because those siblings, the records that they have created, might have more information about the parents, as we have seen in all of these examples today. Think about finding them in all of the census records in which they should appear. Look for all of their vital records, their birth records, marriage, and death records. And definitely look for their obituaries. You never know what little clue you're going to be able to pull out of it that could really break through that brick wall that you have. Next week on the archives.com live stream, we are going to tackle the topic, how good is that record? Evaluating sources. That will be next Wednesday, the 7th of August at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. In the meantime, stay connected with archives.com. You can do it in a variety of ways, whether it's through our blog, liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter, or subscribing to our YouTube channel. The great thing about subscribing to the YouTube channel is that you'll get an email every time that we upload a video such as these live streams. So if you are watching this live, pop over to the YouTube channel and you can see all of our past live streams. All of them have been uploaded there. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, stop by and watch our live streams on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock Eastern. Uh, join us in the chat room. We have great conversation, great question and answers, and think that you'll really enjoy that. Until next week, this is Amy Johnson Crow wishing you happy researching. <laughs>